Good morning, the Network Berg here. Welcome back again to the Network Fundamentals course. This is the third lecture where we will be going over the network switch or more specifically layer two things in general. Before we jump into the actual switching, you see there's a picture of some ladies there with something that looks quite similar to a switch actually. Uh, these ladies used to be called call operators um, and I just want to tell you the story before we actually continue because switches work very similar. These ladies, they used to uh, sit in these little cubicles and they would receive calls from somebody. It could be even somebody from your, your parents' time or even your grandparents' time where they would place a call. But instead of the call just getting to the person they're trying to reach, it would get to one of these ladies and they would answer the call and they would say, hello, sir, how are you? What are you doing? Um, uh, who would you like to phone? And then I would tell them, I'd like to phone my friend, John. He lives in a different city. This is the city. Can you put me through to him? And this call operator lady, she would look at um, the cable where the call was coming from that you call from. She would take that in the other end of the cable and she would physically move it to a different port on this switch board. That's what it's called, the switch board. You see the similarity already? Once she puts the cable into the other switch board, the call would ring at your friend's house and your friend would answer the phone and say, hello, this is John, how are you? And now you guys have a connection. You guys are able to exchange a conversation. Switching works pretty much the same. I would dare say that switching has evolved from this because switches essentially took these people's jobs away because we put switches in place of telephone calls now as well that does this process automatically. So that is what a switch does. It gets a packet from a computer. It looks at uh, which port it comes from and then it will quickly uh, take that uh, frame or that packet and it would switch it out of the port where it's trying to get to your friend. Before we jump into actual switching, let's just talk about media access control addresses or for short, a MAC address. You would hear this a lot. It is something a lot of uh, vendors also talk about or want you to know. So what is a MAC address? Well, it is a physical address that is burned into each and every NIC or network interface card or each port on the switch. Those are all NICs as well. They, it's a unique address. Each port will have its own unique address. None of them are the same anywhere on the planet. MAC addresses consist of 48 bits or 12 digits and make use of hexadecimal numbering. So this would mean that your addresses can work anywhere from zero to one. You can have that in a MAC address or you could have the letters A to F. So you could have any combination of those numbers and letters to make up a MAC address. There's an example MAC address, what it looks like. I took this off of a virtual Cisco switch. And uh, if you drag that into a Mac vendor site or something, you might see who the vendor is. The first six digits of a MAC address, that is always going to be, think of it as the organization identifier. Um, this would be the vendor's unique MAC address that they get when they register to start making networking equipment. So those first digits would be a vendor like Cisco or Juniper or Mikrotik. It could be a number of vendors, but the first six digits would identify who that vendor is and the last six digits or um, numbers or letters would identify it, it it's more of just for the nick itself so that is the unique number of the nick think of that as your number plate as your car for your car your car has a number plate but it could also have something like a vin number that is registered to the manufacturers uh, switches or switch ports make use of mac addresses in order to forward or drop frames so a switch will use a MAC address, when it receives a frame, it will look at the source MAC address that it receives and it will look at a destination MAC address and then the switch will kind of know what to do with it. We'll dive in a little bit more into that when we talk about the switches coming up next. If you want some more information, I have posted the wiki page for it, but you can just search on Google for MAC address and it will direct you to what is a MAC address on wiki. This is just an image what a MAC address would typically look like. Like I said, the first six digits or the, the first three octets, it's like the pairs, 
that is the OIU organizationally unique identifier. Like I said, it's just for the vendor. And then the last three is just for the NIC. There we can see again an example of a MAC address. And this is really it. This is what a MAC address looks like, guys. This gets put, put into an Ethernet frame when a, any kind of communication occurs. And it's kind of very important to know as well, because this is a source and destination type of thing, and switches work with these MAC addresses. You can kind of think of a MAC address as the IP address that switches use to talk to each other, or switch ports more exactly. Next up, the network switch. The main function of the network switch is to learn MAC addresses and to switch frames between ports. Very important, that is what a switch does. You can get a layer three switch, it does some routing, but the main point of a switch is to switch traffic. When the switch receives a frame, it will place that frame into the CAM table, its content accessible memory, where it stores almost all of its MAC addresses that it's learned and it knows which ports those MAC addresses are bound to. So that's what a CAM table is. When the switch needs to forward a frame, it will look at its CAM table to see where the destination MAC address is and then it would forward that frame out of that port. If a switch does not know a destination MAC address, it will send out a broadcast message, an ARP, out of all of its ports to try and learn that MAC address. A switch that comes out of the box generally comes with one broadcast domain so that means ports that it broadcasts out of and also as many collision domains as you can connect up to it let's say you have a 24 port switch you could possibly have 24 collision domains if you plug in 24 different hosts in there so th think of a collision domain as the actual connection between two ports that that could be a collision domain that could cause some collisions but we don't really have collisions anymore since we're using switches uh, back in the hub days and the bridge days, that might have been a problem, but not so much in the switch world. Reason being, switches operate on a hardware level. Somebody very smart developed a chip and put it in an ASIC, application-specific integrated circuit. It's on your switch. And this chip, its whole function is to figure out the switching process. And it's always doing it very well, very quickly. So the switch isn't relying on software to make these decisions, it's all built into it from the beginning due to the ASIC. Next up, let's talk about VLANs or virtual LANs or 802.1Q specifically. There is a newer version out now that a lot of people will see in SDNs, but I want to go over this because this is the beginning of networking and you're gonna learn so much from 802.1Q. So what is a VLAN? Well, a VLAN allows us a way to partition our switch ports into more than one broadcast domain. What does that mean? If we have a 24 port switch, we could ideally split 12 ports for one section, one purpose, and the other 12 ports for something else. And only the first 12 ports would be able to talk to each other on a broadcast domain because they're in the same VLAN. The other 12 ports would also only be able to talk to each other because they're in a different VLAN. If you want those VLANs to be able to communicate with each other, then we're going to have to start looking at things like routers to actually do that. When ports are tagged to a specific VLAN, only frames that contain that VLAN ID inside the frame will be sent across the wire. So that's also very important. Again, if I get a packet in port one that's in VLAN one and um, it doesn't know where to go, if there's a broadcast message being sent out, only all of the ports on VLAN one will get that broadcast. None of the ports on VLAN 12 we get that broadcast or packet. So it's, it's kind of like a security thing as well. It helps us out um, partition or section out our network how we want it. VLANs can provide added security. Well, that, that's kind of what we just said. Uh, VLAN, you can create different VLANs for different requirements. So ideally, you'll see this a lot. People will create like a corporate VLAN for the data users. They might create a finance VLAN where all of the finance people go sit in because they've got their own IP range in that finance department which is supposed to be secure. Uh, you could have some sales, guest networks so that your guests are only in their own VLAN. They can't get to the corporate things to potentially take stuff that they're not supposed to take. Um, VLANs can support up to a, a maximum of 4096 different VLAN IDs. 
but realistically it's only 4093 because three of the VLANs are actually reserved. It's something like 1001 to 1003, but um, you, you can still use the VLANs. I'm just mentioning it that they are kind of a proprietary thing on something like Cisco, where you, you might not just be able to take the VLAN because it's in some um, old proprietary system there. Here's just another picture of what different broadcast domains might look like. Let's say I have a laptop in VLAN 1. The port goes into, let's say that's port 2 on the Cisco. If I try and get to a machine in VLAN 2, it won't work because the switch will not allow me to get onto those broadcast domains. There's two separate broadcast domains here, VLAN 1 and VLAN 2. However, I would be able to get to the other laptop in VLAN 1 on the last port of the Cisco. And the same for the desktop machines, the two machines in VLAN 2, they would be able to communicate directly. So very important to note as well about network communication. If you only have machines in the same subnet or in the same network and VLAN, they will be able to talk to each other without a router. You don't need a router for host to host communication when it's on something basic like a switch level like that. The only reason we get routers is to break out of our networks, to get to a different VLAN, to get to a different IP and to get to a different network. That is the end of the presentation. I'd like to thank you for watching and I do encourage you to go to the networkberg.com to visit my blog, have a look at some of the ideas posted on there. But before we end that off, I just want to give you some real examples of what it looks like when you are doing switch or host to host communication. So I've brought up a little Cisco switch here with two computers. I've put them all or both the computers in the 192.168.0.0 slash 24 subnet. This computer is dot one, PC two is dot two. I'm just quickly going to show you the process of what happens when we do communication. So let's stop that ping. Let's just do another ping. So we, we know there is network communication already. Just want to see if this works. ARP. So if I do an ARP from this computer, I can only see this MAC address. And that is 0 0.1 that I'm pinging and it sees it on Ethernet 01. So it's learned to get to that MAC address. I can get there by going through Ethernet 01. Similar if I get onto the switch, Do a show ARP? No ARP, why not? Well, because the switch isn't operating at an IP or routing level, so it's not seeing IP addresses. But if I do a show MAC address table, I can see two MAC addresses here, and these are the two MAC addresses of my computers. So the process really is, if PC2 does a ping or any type of network traffic, is going to come in to a specific port. I believe it is 01 for PC2, and that's on GI01. The switch knows that PC2 is on GI01, and it knows what the MAC address is of PC2. Similar, it knows what the MAC address is of PC1, and it knows that it is on port GI00. So any type of frame or packet that I'm trying to send to PC1 from PC2, the switch will receive that packet, make it into a frame, look at the source and destination MAC addresses. So it will see, okay, it's this is the source and it came from GI01. Okay, I'm going to send it because I see your destination MAC address is this. I'm going to send that frame out of GI0 slash zero. So the switch isn't even using an IP address to establish that communication. This is all working at layer two using the MAC addresses and the ports to actually establish that communication. That is really what I wanted to quickly show you. It's very basic on how switching works, but it is very important to know as well. Um, we can quickly, yeah, let, let's quickly do a couple of VLANs as well. We got a little bit of time, so I don't want to stress you guys out too much. I don't want to feed too much information either, but let's do the same thing as what was on that uh, picture quickly. I'm just gonna bring up uh, two more computers and I'm going to put them into different VLANs. So let's bring them into 
the last two ports there. Okay. And guys, this is GNS3. I've mentioned this before. There is a section on the blog that details how to install this so that you can do similar things yourself. Okay, let's quickly give these computers uh, different IP addresses. Network. Let's make this 172.16.01. I'm not even going to assign default gateways because we don't need that. We're not breaking out to a different network. 172.16.0.2. So if I ping these IPs, they will be able to still get to each other, uh, but they will not be able to get to the other uh, network, the 192 network, because it's in a different subnet. So there's no routing because that, that would kind of fall on the routing section but they're all still in VLAN 1, which could pose a security risk. So I'm just quickly going to bring those into a different VLAN. Interface range GI3021. I'm just going to switch port mode access, switch port access. Let's make it VLAN, VLAN 2. Okay. You see the switch automatically created it for us. And we will go more into VLANs on Cisco's and stuff, guys. I just want to quickly show you um, that the broadcast stop and that those machines will never be able to, even if we put them in the same subnet mask, like they won't be able to talk to each other because they're in a different VLAN. Show MAC address. Okay. So we, we don't see any MAC addresses because remember it's stored in the CAM, it, it's content accessible memory. So the switcher's job is to continuously learn these MAC addresses and it will remember it for a set amount of time. It, it's not indefinite, but if your switch has IP addresses on it, it will continuously send out ARPs as well and it will keep those uh, MAC addresses stored. So similar, I'm just going to run a ping. 172.16.0.2 okay jump into the switch i can see my source and destination mac addresses again it saw that the traffic was coming from this mac address and this is the port it was coming from to that mac address and which port it needs to go out of and the great thing is we can see the vlans as well so this is in vlan 2 which means that these machines and these ports will only be able to talk to each other, not uh, a different VLAN. And this is just due to how the VLANs have been set up. So now technically on the switch, we have two different broadcast domains and we have four collision domains as well. This is the end of the lecture. I do hope it has been informative and that you've learned something new. I'd like to thank you for watching. I do encourage you to subscribe to the channel, like the videos if you find that the content is helping you. Thanks again.